What you're looking at here is my CI, or Computer Inventory 2, Relationships Database. And down below I try to break up my data into the smallest, most meaningful parts, or tables. That way my search is more efficient if I just want to look at the computers and not pull up everything else within my database. But by the same token, if my tables are related, in that I want to be able to assign each employee a computer and keep track of that, I need to do just that. I need to relate this table, the employees, to the computers. So when I open up the computers, instead of just the basic fields that I have for the computers, I need to add another field that's going to be able to tie to or link to the primary key field in the employees table. So let me double click to open it up. And for the most part, here are the fields, the original fields in the table for the computers, except for the manufacturer, but we'll go over that in just a minute, and also the employee ID which I added that. It has the same name as the employee ID as the primary key field in the employees table. You want to take a look? Alrighty, come over here, double click, employees table. There you go, employee ID. Now that's the primary key field. How do you know? Well, you can right click on the tab, go to the design view, and there you go, employee ID. You got the pretty little key next to it in the row header. And then you want to make sure that when you link a foreign key field to a primary key field, that it has the same data type. It doesn't have to have the same name. You can have the name Scooby-Doo for this one. It doesn't matter, except you'll avoid confusion if you keep the names the same, which is what I recommend, and you'll see that in a later training video. But for right now, I just recommend keeping the names the same. And then the data type has to be the same. So we've got number here. Did I do that over in the computers table? Let's right click, go to the design view, Yes, the same data type, number. I also added over here the descriptions for the fields, so when I hand this off to somebody else to manage the database, they have an idea of why I added this field, like the employee ID. It's the ID number of employee to whom the computer is assigned. So when I come up here, right click, go to the data sheet view, and now each employee has a bunch of information within its table. You can see over here, well, you've got the first name, last name, department code. Let's go back. And I don't want to pull all that data into this table because maybe I just want the employee's first name and the computer that they're assigned to or maybe just the department to find out which one has the most computers. And you can do all that once you create these links to these tables in what's known as a query. Because if you don't do it this way, you don't link your tables up so there's no relationships, then if you want to find out, now this is very annoying, but if you want to find out who's assigned to, well, this barcode right here because maybe it's outdated, the computer, they're having a recall and they're saying, hey, we need to go ahead and have this fixed or returned, then you'd have to come over here and find out the employee ID because we don't have the name here. Remember, we're trying to keep it efficient in case if we don't want to pull it all up at once, but now we want to pull up the employee name, so what's six? I don't know. We'd have to open up the employee's table well, right click and go to the data sheet view and go down to number six, Britt Hume. Oh, well, that was fun. Buzz, no. So instead, you can generate a query. Once you link these tables up and say you just want to pull in and see from the employee's table the last name and from the computer's table the asset tag that's been assigned to that employee. And you can view all that in one window. You don't have to toggle back and forth because it's pulling in what you want from these tables as long as they have relationships. Again, as long as you have a foreign key field in one table that links to the primary key field in the other with the same data and data type. It doesn't have to be the same name, but you'll see again later on how important that is to avoid confusion when you want to relate the employee ID from the computer's table to the employee, the primary key, employee ID in the employee's table. And then you'll see, and let's go ahead and close out of here, and then you can see in addition to the employee ID, in the computer's table, I also added the manufacturer, the ID. I don't have the manufacturer's name because the less I pull up when I don't need to see it, the more efficient and quickly I can pull it up. It doesn't bog down the database, especially if we have a bunch of users ping in the database at the same time. It can really slow things down. So what I did is I broke up into the smallest, most meaningful parts, the name of the manufacturers, double-click to open it up, and you can have additional fields like their address, phone number, and so on, but I wanted to keep it simple. We'll just go with the names here. So instead of pulling the names over here into this field, because, well, the names have an average of five or six characters as opposed to one, it's more efficient, isn't it? Well, in that, if I pull up the computer's table and I don't care to look at the manufacturer's name, 
then there's less to pull up, less characters, so it's more efficient. But if I do want to pull them up, well, then we got a query, again, as we talked about, that once you have your tables, you can create queries to pull information out from fields, from different tables here, into one single view of the query, as long as the tables are related. In any case, back to the manufacturer here, we want to make sure that when you have a foreign key field that you're creating in a table to link to the main table, the original table, like the manufacturer's, it has the primary key field there. It doesn't have to have the same name. The manufacturer, I can call it MF and abbreviate that. That doesn't matter. It matters later on if you're trying to make sense of what the acronym, whatever you give it, when you're linking to the primary key field in another table or vice versa. In any case, it's got to have the same data type and data. So we can go ahead and right click, design view, and manufacturer, the ID's number. Now that's got to match the data type in the manufacturer's table. Right click, design view. Now that one's got the auto number, which is okay because this is the primary table, the primary key that we're relating the foreign key in the computer's table to that. And so we want to be able to, when we get a computer, is to be able to have the manufacturers listed there. So if I come into the computer's table, go to the data sheet view, and I'm entering in another computer, and I'm like, okay, I want to enter in manufacturer number six. Well, if you have the codes memorized, if not, you can go ahead and create a query or do a lookup field that you can click in here. It'll have a list of the numbers and then the names to the right of that. And I can show you how to do that in a later training video as well. But in any case, the point being is that we can't add a computer here if we don't first have a manufacturer ID for it. Well, let me right click, go to the data sheet view and have an ID. So if we just got new computers in today from a new manufacturer and I typed in number six, Belcron, then after I enter it in here, I can come over here and then type in number six. Because again, that's the foreign key is based upon the primary key. So if it's not the primary key first, can't do anything here. We just have to go with what's currently available. So if I did update it and we did have number six in there, then I can go ahead and type in number six if I haven't memorized or again, look up fields or create a query. One window to be able to view the manufacturer's name and maybe just the barcode or whatever other fields you'd like to pull in as long as again the tables are all related either directly or indirectly through another table. Creating relationships is a two-step process and we did the first step in the previous training video so you want to watch it or this one's going to be very confusing to you and as you recall we created a foreign key which is a copy of the primary key field like I did in the employees table and added it to the computers because I want to keep track of all the computers that are assigned to each employee. So for example, when you open up the employees table, what I did is I basically replicated the primary key field, didn't copy over the primary key, just replicated that field, which includes the name in the field, employee ID, and the type of data stored in that field or the data type. And I went to the computers table and added that as the last field in that table, employee ID. And you can see here we have a total of 24 employees who have computers assigned to them as opposed to, well, we got more employees than we do computers at this point. But in any case, once you have these two set up here, there's a place you can go to and access where you can hook up these tables together, link them or relate them. And again, why do you want to link them up? So if I want to pull up the last name of an employee or their first name and last name like Homer Simpson, and also the asset tag or barcode that's assigned to Homer. I don't have to pull up both tables and include all these fields and then toggle back and forth between the two. Instead, I can do a query, one view, that allows me to pull in the fields that I want to see from both tables once they're related or linked. So I could say, okay, from the computer's table, just show the asset tag, and then from the employees, give me the first and last name. Makes it a lot more efficient than me coming in here and pulling up both tables. Now, in addition, let me close out of these tables. When all is said and done, my tables are all going to relate to each other either directly or indirectly. What I don't recommend doing is linking one table to all the other tables. For example, with my database here, I've got the computers linked to the employees. And computers are also linked to the manufacturers. I'm not going to link the employees to the manufacturers because it's got nothing to do with computers, at least directly. So if I want to pull up an employee, and the manufacturer that produced the computer for that employee or the computer that's assigned to the manufacturer name because the computers is linked to the employees 
and also the manufacturers, I got an indirect link through the computers from employees to the manufacturers. That can pull up all that information in a query instead of me opening up all three tables and trying to figure out, okay, first off, we got the employees. Let me get the employee ID to go over to the tables. Look up the ID to find the manufacturer, the ID to that, that's assigned to that computer, to go to the manufacturer's table to open that up and go, okay, it's number three. Oh, it's Macron who manufactured the computer for that employee. And then the departments is directly linked to the employees. And so if I want to find out how many computers are in each department, I don't have to pull up the employees because computers is linked to the employees and indirectly through employees to the departments. I've seen a few databases where somebody had one table and had a dozen other tables all linked up to that one table. It didn't seem very efficient to me. In any case, again, there's a place you can go to an access where you can link the primary key field in one table to its duplicate field or foreign key field in another table, where it has the same name as the primary key and has the same type of data or data type. And that's found up here. Go to the Database Tools tab to the Relationships group and click on Relationships, and now you're in the Relationships window. And metaphorically speaking, I call this the dance floor. In other words, when you have people on the dance floor here, they're going to look at each other and try to find something in common or something that they like about them. And then you start creating those relationships or hooking up or linking up. So how do we get these tables, or metaphorically speaking, these people onto the dance floor so we can see what they got in common or what they're going to be able to relate to? Being able to see their primary key and foreign key fields and being able to link them up. You can do it one of a couple of ways. You can either come up here on the Design tab to the Relationships group and click on, there you go, Show Table, shows you the tables, or Close Out. You can right-click over here on the Dance Floor, and there you go, Show Table, same window. And to be able to add tables to the Dance Floor, as it were, you can either go ahead and double-click and it adds it, or if you want to select more than one, hold down the Shift key and click, and it selects everything, well, from the first selection down to the click, when holding the Shift key, that is. Or if it's nonlinear, like you want to do computers and maybe employees, hold down the control key and click on employees and we'll control click manufacturers. But let me go ahead and go back to computers, hold down the shift key and select down to manufacturers and then click add. When we're done adding them, just go ahead and close out. Now I added the same table twice, computers. There's the original name, then there's the original name plus one, as it were. And so to get rid of this copy, this doppelganger, you can either right-click on the title bar to hide the table, or you can click on the title bar and hit the delete key, and it hides it. It doesn't delete the computer's table over here. It just hides the table, the extra table that we added over here in the relationships window. Now we have all these people on the dance floor, as it were, and we want to find out what they have in common. Now see if this makes sense the way I set it up. Let me go ahead and click and drag the title bar for manufacturers so I can move that table and come over here click and drag the employees so we can get up close and personable to the computers because why? Well, they got something in common. What's that? The employee ID, the primary key, and there's the key for primary and the foreign key field over in the computer's table. Now, by the way, if you can't see all the fields within the table because it's crunched, you can hover over one of the borders until you can see arrows pointing in opposite directions, then click and drag to stretch it horizontally or the bottom border more vertically. Of course, if you crunch it, you'll have to scroll, but I don't want to scroll, so let me stretch it open until I can see all the fields. And then looking at the names, doesn't it make sense to have the same name as the primary key field here? Because, I mean, voila, you can spot it right off the bat. That one goes to that one. You can name it whatever you want. You can call it Scooby-Doo. It doesn't care. It'll link it up as long as you have the same data type and also the same data. So again, it's easier for me to spot it when I'm hooking up one table to the next to go, oh yeah, that's right. I remember the employee ID goes to the primary key employee ID field here. So anytime I add a new computer here, I have to pull an ID if I want to assign this to an employee from the employee's table. And so if I have 48 IDs over here, 1 through 48, and I add a new computer and I want to assign it to employee 49, and again, I just have a total of 48, when I link them up, relate these two fields together, this table over here is going to say, what are you doing? I don't have employee ID 49, and so you won't be able to save the record. You can only enter in an ID that's available in the employee's table. 
So there's data integrity there, and I'm not adding extra employees that shouldn't be assigned a computer when we don't really have an employee over here in the employees table. Okay, so they've got something in common here. Remember, foreign key to the primary key field, they both have the same data, same data type. So let's go ahead and link them up. To do that, in this training video, we're talking about relationships. This is a one-to-many relationship. You can link primary key to foreign key or foreign key to primary key. It doesn't matter. So to link them up, you can go ahead and click on one and drag it over on top of the next. So I can do it, well, foreign to primary or again, primary to foreign. So let's go ahead and do it. Click and hold down the mouse button on the foreign employee ID and start dragging it up and you can see it's moving it. But you have a circle with the line through it saying, well, you can't dump it back into its own table. And when you go over to the dance floor, it's like it doesn't want to fall down on the dance floor, get embarrassed. But when you go into the other table, it goes, ah, you can see you got the pointer with the plus sign below it, meaning that it's adding it over, copying it, because it's not really moving it. It's just making a copy of it to put right on top of the key field that we want to hook up and link to the employee ID. Let go and voila, we got the edit relationships window. And down below it says that the employee ID is coming from the employees table to hook up to the employee ID in the computers table. Now we can go ahead and just create the relationship right here, but if I do that without enforcing referential integrity, that means, as I just discussed, let me click and drag the title bar down so we can see up here, that if I add a lot of computers and I start adding an employee ID that's not found in the employee's database, well, it'll allow me to do that because it's not being enforced. So I could type in here employee ID number 50, even though I only have 1 through 48, and it'll save it as 50. So later on when we do an audit and we're like, hey, we gave a computer or assigned it to employee ID 50. We have no 50 in here. It only goes from 1 to 48. Oh, somebody's cooking the books. They're making up employees here. Well, with referential integrity, it would lock that down because if it's not in here and you try to type it in here or enter the ID here, again, it'll block it. And to prevent accidental errors, you can go ahead and have a lookup field that when you click in the employee ID foreign key field, it'll pull in all the employees there, their corresponding numbers you can assign to. Or you can do a query that just pulls up the employees and so you can get the right employee. In any case, access is a process. We'll learn about that in a later training video. Right now, we're just trying to hook up and make sure it's done right. Now, there may be a time where you may not want to enforce referential integrity. For example, let's say we've got a notes table, and we're going to have notes on some of the computers, not all the computers. So we relate them. I don't want to be able to enforce it, meaning that I have to have a note for every computer because maybe the notes are just about, okay, this one's out of warranty. This one we need to do a checkup on. I don't want to type in something that just for the sake of trying to take care of referential integrity. So that might be one example where you don't enforce it, where you don't have to have a note for every single computer if you have a separate table for notes for the computers. And so the definition of enforcing referential integrity is that it prevents the user entering in a value that doesn't exist in the related table and accidental deletion or changes that would invalidate the relationship between the tables. Now, I don't know about you, but just checking the box to enforce doesn't help me because when it comes to these fields and records, I update them all the time. Like maybe an employee quits or gets fired, I want to be able to remove that employee from the table. So just enforcing it doesn't allow me to delete the employee record because it's going to be tied to the employee ID for the computer that they're assigned to. And so in order to update related fields and delete related records, that's right, you see it down below, update related fields, delete related records, you want to go ahead and check the cascading options. But keep in mind that when you do delete an employee, that it will also delete the corresponding computer that they're assigned to. And why would it do that? Well, if I come over here and I delete employee number 48, number 48 is still there. And so since it's no longer available over here, you see that creates integrity issues. And with it being enforced, it says to keep everything the same or balanced so we're not missing something over here. And then we're going to go ahead and delete the related computer to that employee. And so if you want to assign that computer to another employee, you don't want to delete that employee, but think of other ways or avenues to add a new employee first 
and then reassign that computer to the new employee before you delete the old employee. Or you can create a field that the employee's been fired or is no longer working with us. That way we still have their information without deleting it and deleting the corresponding computer that they're assigned to before we assign it to somebody else. Or just simply come over here in the computers table and remove that employee from that computer, leave it blank. That works, so that computer's not assigned to that employee. And then before we go ahead and click Create, notice at the bottom, the relationship type, it's one-to-many, as opposed to the other type being one-to-one. -one. And we'll talk about one-to-one -one in the next training video, but let's go ahead and click on Create. And there's the link from the employee ID to the employee ID of the primary key. And so what I add over here, as long as it's over here in this table first, the employee ID, it'll be assigned that employee to a computer here. And so it's kind of squished here, this link. Let's go ahead and click and drag it down here and stretch it out so it looks like that. And if that gets in the way, I'll click and drag those out of, click and drag those out of the way. So there's the one, meaning that you can only have one unique record employee ID, one employee in the employees table, that's Bob Smith. And so there's the one. That means the employee ID has got to be unique. No duplicates. So if the employee ID was their social security number, we want to make sure we don't have that duplicated. Otherwise, we might be hiring somebody who stole the social security number from somebody else. In any case, there you go. As opposed to the infinity symbol, which is the many meaning that you can have one employee that has, well, many employee IDs over here, meaning that they can be assigned to many computers. Maybe one's a desktop, another one's a laptop or a tablet. Now, if you made a mistake and you didn't mean to relate, well, this field to that field, you can, of course, go ahead and right-click on that thin, skinny line and select Edit Relationship. And then you can go ahead and make the changes and say, okay, from the employees table, I didn't want it to be the employee ID, but I wanted it to be, well, maybe that field. So you can click on the drop-down arrow and choose another field to relate it to the other field if you made a mistake there. Make your changes. Go ahead and update it. Click okie dokie. I'm going to click cancel. Or, as you saw, when you click on that skeevy little line, you can also delete it. Are you sure? Yes. And it's gone. And now to bring it back again, you're just clicking and dragging. And it doesn't matter when it's a one-to-many relationship type, or you can have only one here to many over here in the other table that you click and drag from left to right, in this case, or right to left, from foreign key to primary key. So, you know, just click and drag and dump it right on top of it and force, and we're back to where we started. Fabulous. Now let's go ahead and look at all the other relationships that we can create between these tables. They're kind of standing off by themselves, all shy and such. But you can see I've got the foreign key department code. That's why I put it at the end. When I look at the end, I'm basically trying to match it up with one of these tables that, ah, there we go. I know it was obvious, but I wanted to show you that I can look around, especially if I had a bunch of tables in here and I took over somebody else's database. If they designed it the way I did, I can just look at the bottom of any one of these tables and see if there's a duplicate name with that being the primary key in another table. And there you go, department code. So great. Go ahead and click and drag from one to the other and let's enforce and do the cascading to update and delete related records. Click create. And then let's see, manufacture the foreign key. And since I don't have it as a primary key, I do have the foreign key manufacturer ID that can go to the primary key right there. And even though that's not the last one, that's okay. I guess I could have moved the manufacturer ID down to the bottom so I could keep the foreign key fields at the bottom, but it doesn't matter. It's how you want to organize it, but you can still do it. It doesn't have to be at the bottom of the table. So there we go, manufacturer ID to the primary key in the other table, enforce, and click create, and there we go. Okay, it looks like a mess. Let's go ahead and clean it up. We can move this guy down and click and drag the ton of bar him. Oh, let's do it straight. Let's see if we can go ahead and line it just perfectly. Oh, that's nice. And then you come over here. Okay, and then you come down here. Now, all these tables are either directly related to each other or indirectly like the manufacturers to the departments, I can eventually talk to them through these others here. I got these codependent relationships that, well, I talk to him and say, okay, what do we have in common? The manufacturers right there. And from that, I can access his information and say, okay, from you, how do I get to this person? Well, it's through the employee ID. And then when I access that, then it will relate to the department code. So long story short, I can do a query that I just need to pull up the manufacturer name and the department name to find out which manufacturers assigned to which department. Maybe we have five departments and 
four out of the five have the same manufacturer. So maybe that's the popular one that we go with because they like that particular manufacturer. And then when you're done with your layout, just go ahead and click close. And it says it wants to save the changes to the layout. Okay, yes. Closes out, then to go back to it, click on database tools, relationships, relationships, move it around or click and drag and stretch it. And then go ahead and click save. So when you close out, and of course you go back to it again, it remembers where you moved it and the resizing of those tables. Okay, right off the bat, you can tell we're in a different database by looking up here on the title bar. The name's different. It's table data. And then down below, I try to break the data down into the smallest, most meaningful tables where I can keep track of all the employees in one, separate from the customers, and so on. And we're going to learn how to create a one-to-one -one relationship. As you recall in the previous training video, when we create a relationship, it's a two-step process. The first step is to create a foreign key in one table that we're going to link up to the primary key in another table. And once you create those foreign keys and you're ready to introduce those tables to one another or to create those relationships or links, well, come up here, as you recall, and click on the Database Tools tab. Go to the Relationships group. Click on Relationships. And, oh, there you go. Look at that. We got a total of three as opposed to five here. Well, three tables is sufficient for what I want to cover in this training video. And so first off, we got the customers table because we got to have a customer in order to have an order because, you know, who's going to buy our products? And then when it comes to billing the customer, well, we can't bill nobody. So everything's based upon here, the customers table. So keep that in mind because when we talk about relationships, it's going to make a little bit more sense. So for example, we have one here that goes out to this table. That's a one to one relationship as opposed to one to infinity, which means many. So we've got a customer here that can be duplicated, the customer ID in the orders table many times. And I sure hope so because man, I'd love them to make a gazillion orders. Yeah. As opposed to, well, when it comes to billing the customer, I just want for our companies, just one person over at that company, their contact, first name, and last name, because I don't want to have to talk to 20 different people in order to get payment. So I'm keeping it simple. So I just, when it comes to our customers, there's just one billing contact that I have at that company to bill. And so in that one-to-one -one relationship, it's coming from one primary key that can only contain a unique value, no duplicates or blanks, to another primary key that again, those primary keys can only contain one unique value for each record and not blanks in that field. Now remember, everything's based upon the customers, right? So I gotta have a customer first before we can have orders, makes sense? Okay, so when it comes to creating a relationship, when it comes from the one unique value, the primary key, to a foreign key that can have many, it doesn't matter how you create that relationship. Um, this table can be the aggressor and click and drag the customer ID up here to the unique customer ID, the primary key, or vice versa. It's always going to be from one to many, or we can have many here and one there. Now you could say, well, in a one-to-one -one relationship, it doesn't matter because it's going to be one-to-one. -one. Not so, because in this one-to-many relationship, can I come down here and type in a customer ID if I don't have it here? No, because it has to be in here first before we can go ahead and make the orders. Could you say the same in a one-to-one -one relationship? Say, okay, let me go ahead and create the customer ID here. Well, common sense would say no, because you got to have a customer first before you can go ahead and pull that unique value over here into this to be able to bill them. So what I'm getting at here is that when you click and drag from the customer ID, the one to the many, the foreign key, or from the foreign key to the one, it doesn't matter. You can drag it from one to the other or the other to the one. But when it comes to going from a one-to-one -one relationship, from primary key to primary key, it makes a huge difference which table you're dragging from first. So metaphorically speaking, if I come over here and I click the customer ID to drag it over to this table, whoever the aggressor is in the relationship that's extending their hand first, that's introducing themselves first to create that relationship, is always going to be in control. So you always have to generate and create the customer ID over here if you extend it first over to the other one in a one-to-one -one relationship because the other one just accepts what you've got. So if I go, eh, I'm just going to come over here and click and drag from this customer ID 
over on top of that one in a one-to-one -one relationship, guess what? You cannot generate the customer ID over here because since this was the aggressor and it extended their hand first by dragging it from this table over to the other, you have to create the customer ID here first. Now that doesn't make sense, does it? Because we're generating customers in the customer's table, so we want that to be the aggressor. That's where we started off. So I got to make sure that I click and drag this customer ID over here to the billing and not the other way around. So to simply state it again, whichever table in a one-to-one -one relationship that you want to be able to generate that unique ID first and the other one just goes along with it, then go ahead and drag it from that table to the other. So whatever table you drag it from first to the other, that's the one that you can go ahead and generate it. The other one just has to accept in the one-to-one -one relationship, whatever you do, there's got to be some rules and regulations here. And that's how it's done in a one-to-one -one relationship. So let's go ahead and have some fun here. I'm going to go ahead and right-click on this one-to-one -one and delete the relationship. And yes, permanently delete it. But I can go ahead and click and drag it back again to create the one-to-one -one relationship. Because the question I have is that if you take over somebody else's database and it doesn't make sense to you, well, it does here, you know, you want to generate the customers first, but maybe they didn't watch my training video when they created a one-to-one -one relationship. So they clicked and dragged it from the billing to the customers here where you have to generate the unique value here first in the billing. And it just accepts it over here in the customers. And there's no way to find out, at least looking from the relationships window, because it doesn't red flag you saying, okay, it was initiated over in this table or that table. So the only way you can find out is, well, you can open up the tables and try to generate a unique number in the customer's table first. And if it accepts it, you're good. If it rejects it, that means you have to go to the other table first in the one-to-one -one relationship and create that unique value, type it in, and then you can see the other one that you can bring it over and it will accept it there. Or, as I just did, delete the relationship and start over. So that way you'll know that when you click and drag from one field over to the next and let go and say enforce and do updates and delete records, the cascade options and click create, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. As you recall, I did it from the billing info first over to the customers, meaning that I have to generate the unique ID there first, not in the customers. So this is the aggressor. Let's go ahead and play with this and see if we can drive the point home. How about deleting a record? Mm, that'll be interesting. If I go ahead and delete the customer here, it will, because in a one-to-many relationship, also delete all the orders tied to that customer ID. Because when I double-click on the thin line here, it has the options, the cascading options, to update and delete related records. So let's click Cancel. But if I delete it here in a one-to-one -one relationship, will it delete it from the billing info? No, because remember, that is the one that generated the relationship by dragging it from that table first over to the other. And so let's go ahead and bring up the billing table, customers, and orders. So in the customers table, let's take a customer here. There's, well, you can't see the IDs cut off, so let's hover in between the two column headers here. Until I can get arrows pointing in opposite directions and double click really fast. Oh, now I can see it. Okay, customer ID. So let's take a look at the customer ID 31365. That's the one that we're going to delete from the customers table. When I delete it, it will delete it from the orders table and, oh, well, there it is, customer. Well, hover over the right hand side of the column header there until I can see arrows. Double click really fast. There we go, customer ID. And where's three? Well, let me go ahead and sort it. Click on the drop down arrow and sort A to Z, and there we go, 31365. We have a total of two of them. Ooh, that's nice, because that means that that customer made more than one order from us. Cool. So when I delete it from the customer's table, it'll delete these two orders, because remember, we have cascading options to update related records or delete related records. And then over in the billing table, there it is, 31365. It won't delete it from here, because again, this is the aggressor, the one that we generate the ID in. And so it's not going to go back here from somebody who in the relationship is not the aggressor. This person's going to go, whatever, I'm not pulling that out. I'm keeping it here. So let's go to the customers table. And there's many ways you can delete a record. You can either go ahead and click on the row header to select it and then come up here on the home tab to the records group and click on delete. Or you can go ahead and with it selected, hit the delete key on the keyboard. Or you can just simply right click on the row header and click delete record 
and it says, okay, you're about to delete this, and it will delete any related records. So what's related to that customer ID? Well, it's in the orders table. They had two orders, but it's not going to go back to the aggressor because they're just going to ignore them because that's the one that initiated the relationship billing info. So let's say yes. And again, once you delete a record, it's toast. So you may want to back up your database. And we'll talk about that in a later training video. We already talked about how you can back up your tables. So in case if you made a mistake, you went, oops, didn't mean to delete that. Then, of course, in that earlier training video, you can go to your backup table. In any case, it's been deleted, okay? So let's go to the orders table. And there you go. It shows you that it's been deleted. Now, if the table was closed and we open it up, it wouldn't show this deletion. It would have been refreshed and it wouldn't pull up. But because we already had it opened, well, if you come up here and click on refresh, it updates it, and the 31365 is gone. But it shouldn't be gone from the billing info table. No, because again, that's the aggressor. Well, let's go ahead and go back to the relationships, and let's turn this around so it's done correctly. So we generate the customer IDs in the customer's table, and then the billing will accept whatever we have over here, because we can't bill somebody if we don't have somebody over here in the customers table. So let's go ahead and right click on that relationship, delete it and say yes, because the customers table is already in use by another person. Okay, we got to close out of the customers table. Fine, click okie dokie. Let's go ahead and close out of all of them. Right click and say close. And yes, we will save the changes. Right click customers and well, close all. And say yes, you want to save those changes to all those tables that we're closing out. But it also closed out of our relationships window. Oh, well, that's okay. Let's go back and go to relationships. And we're back to where we started again. And then we can go ahead after we close out of all of those tables. Or specifically, the first table was the customers. Right click on that. Delete it. And say yes. And it's gone. Now we can go ahead and say okay. Let's have the customers table be the first one to introduce themselves over to the other table so they're the aggressor and let go when we join a one to one relationship and enforce, cascade up and also delete and click create and whoa, what's going on here? It says we can't do this because there's one record in the other table that's not in the original or the aggressor. Remember the 31365 number? Well, we deleted it from the now the aggressor table and it's nowhere to be found here but it's in the other table so it says ah, you can't do that so what do you do let's click ok and close out of here and there are two things you can do let's go to the billing info table you can either go ahead and well take the customer id and add the customer in the customers table you know re-enter in their data there or i'm going to be a weasel i'm not going to recreate i'm just going to go ahead and right click on the row header and delete that contact and say yes I want to do that and so now we don't have any discrepancies when we create that one-to-one -one relationship where we've got from the aggressor everything has to be generated in that table first the customers table before we can go ahead and say okay let's build them so let's close out and let's create that relationship let me go ahead and click and drag Ah, oh, see I was testing you we don't do that we want this to be the aggressor, the customer's table. So let's click and drag the customer ID over to the customer ID, let go, enforce, get our updates, click create, and hey, it's happy. So now I can go ahead and create all my IDs for my customers. And which table? The only table that will allow me to do it is the one that we extended our hand from in the relationship, and that's the customer's table. And then I can go ahead and use that customer ID and type it in the billing info table and pull it over there. If not typing it in, you can do a lookup field, which we'll cover in a later training video. Let's summarize all this up before we take another step. When it comes to creating relationships between tables, it's a two-step process. The first step is to find out which tables you want to hook up or create relationships between. And then you go to the one table and you'll copy the name of the primary key, or at least that's what I do. So it's going to be manufacturer ID, and I paste it over as the same name for the foreign key field in the other table. That way it avoids confusion for me when later on I come to this view, and I want to link the foreign key field in one table to the primary key in the other. I mean, they have the same name. Mystery solved. And also keep in mind you want the same data type as the primary key field here over in your foreign key field. So they can link up just right. Now once you set that up, then come to this view, the relationships window, 
and click and drag the foreign key field in that table on top of the primary key in the other or vice versa, primary key on top of the foreign key. It doesn't matter because what sets the value is going to be the one, the number one in the relationship, and that's going to be the primary key. They're going to make sure that there's no duplicates or every value in that field is going to be unique and no blanks. So you have one unique value there, number one. And so the other just has to accept whatever's been generated over here. If it hasn't been generated here, they can't make it up over here because it comes back to the relationship and checks with the boss here, el numero uno, and you say, okay, do we have any unique values that I can use? Because over here, I'm trying to enter one in and it's giving me an error saying we don't have it yet. Then the person who sets the rules here, the number one in the relationship, will have the front end user come into the table and type in the manufacturer ID along with its name. So then we can go ahead and enter that ID over in the computer's table. Now see if this makes sense. Between the two tables, when it comes to computers, we have the manufacturer ID. Let's say we've got one in there with the number two. And the name of that is Micron. And let's say we bought five computers from them. Well, over here in the computers table, we're going to have the manufacturer ID listed five times because we're going to have a barcode for each computer. Each barcode is unique, and that's why we have the primary key assigned to the asset tag, where down below, this isn't the primary key. It can allow duplicates. So we can have hundreds of computers with each having a different manufacturer or the same manufacturer for that matter, in which case, if they're all going to be the same, you may not want a separate table for the manufacturers. In any case, we'll talk about that more in just a minute. Now, when it comes to relationships that are like one-to-one, -one, as we'll have here, if I want to link the computers up to the notes table, because we've got the asset tag, the key there, and the asset tag there as well. Now, again, when it comes to linking primary keys to each other, it's a one-to-one -one relationship because each one can only contain a unique value, where the many can contain many values. So when you create that one-to-one -one relationship, which one of these primary keys in these separate tables is going to be the one that sets the values for the other one? Because it's not going to tell you after you link it up. The only way that you'll be able to find out which table sets the values after you link it up, if you're not paying attention to how you linked it, because that's a big part of it, then you can go like into this table and try to create a value there in the primary key field. And if it gives you a buzz because it's not listed over in here, well, then you know you can't generate it here and vice versa because the how you link it is the first indicator about who's going to set the values between that one-to-one -one relationship. In other words, the aggressor, the one who extends their hand in fellowship first, is the one that gets to set the standards or generate the values in that field, in that table. So if I click and drag the primary key from this table and I extend the hand of fellowship to this one over here, this one gets to generate and create those values over here in the primary key field, the asset tag. And this one over here just has to accept whatever they have over here. You cannot create any over here. Unless I extend the fellowship from the notes table first and drag the asset tag there, the primary key, on top of the other one in the computers, in which case this one's the aggressor, and they can go ahead and create the values in here where the other one can't generate or create new values. They have to accept in the one-to-one -one relationship what was generated over here first, if at all. Because if not, then, well, you have to come over here and create the ID so we can use it over here in the computer's table. Do I want to have it generated over here, the asset tag, the barcode for notes? That doesn't make sense. The barcode is for computers, right? So I want to make sure that I'm paying attention and not just clicking and dragging and creating a bunch of relationships and hooking them up, that when it comes to one-to-one, -to -one, that I've got to drag it from the computer's table, the barcode, to the notes because the barcode is about computers, not about notes. And so you'll notice here we've got the notes for the barcode and maybe you're going to ask the question, do I really need to break off the notes in a separate table from the computers? That depends because maybe every computer is not going to have a note. And so if not every computer is not going to have a note and I don't break off the notes field into its own table, that's called denormalization because normalizing is breaking down the tables into the smallest, most meaningful parts that are not going to have any blank values, where I'm going to have blank values from time to time in here as far as notes go for each computer, because maybe the notes will be only entered if the computer is having issues. Or better yet, another example is that if you have a client table and some clients have a website address and some don't, instead of creating a second table for the clients called websites and linking it back to the client's table, 
because again, not all clients will have websites you'll end up with some blank values sooner or later, and some experts say it's better to normalize the field down into its own table like that, but it's not a set rule, and I'll have a video on normalization standards later on, but for right now, I want to introduce it to you. And finally, to create this one-to-one -one relationship, I shook things up a bit so you can identify in your own settings, if you run into them, of the issues that may arise when you're trying to create these relationships if you didn't set your fields up correctly. So first of all, you see the asset tags. This one's got a space, the primary key field there, and this one doesn't. So again, when it comes to linking up primary key to primary key or primary key to foreign key, Access doesn't care about the names. You can name them whatever you want, but is it going to make sense to you trying to figure out what you're trying to hook up here? That's why you have the names the same, or this one. They're not the same, so I can show you that Access doesn't care. What it cares about is behind the scenes, that the data type is the same, and also it's got the same information in those fields. So if you have the number five here, and you want to enter in something over here that's not the same or has been generated over here, then it won't allow you to do it if you, in the one-to-one -one relationship, extend the hand of fellowship from over here and extend it to the notes table, because that means whoever extended it sets the values in that one-to-one -one relationship. It's always going to be in a one-to-many, the one who sets the values, because it's going to be unique. But in a one-to-one, -one, it's the aggressor, whoever you click and drag and extend the hand first to. And for me, it's just common sense. When I have the primary key, the barcode for the computers, it's about the computers and not about the notes. Do I have barcode for notes that I want to take about the computers? Well, if I don't have computers, then I won't have any notes. So that's why when it comes to a one-to-one -one relationship, common sense is going to rule over here that I want this to be the aggressor because I'm creating my computers here for the employees. I'm not creating notes for the employees, but they're for the computers. So let's go ahead and select the primary key here and click and drag to extend the fellowship here to dump it on top of the asset tag in the other table, that primary key there, to make it a one-to-one. -one. So we can set the values here because they extended their hand first. And then enforce, cascade, update, and delete related records. Click create and uh-oh, we're in a quandary. Relationship must be the same number of fields with the same data type. Well, I contend if we fix the data types, we won't care about the same number of fields, at least in this situation, because right now I don't have any notes at all. And so let me go ahead and click OK and click Cancel so we can verify this. Let's open up the computers table. How many records do we have? We've got a total of 24 you can see down below in the record navigation bar. And then in the notes, double click, how many do we have here? Zippo. Okay, but what about the data types? So with the cursor flashing in that field, let's come up here and click on the fields tab. Formatting group, the data type is number. Now what about computers? Because they have to be the same data type for the primary keys. You can see the cursor is flashing in the asset tag field. Doesn't matter anywhere in that column for that field. To the formatting group and the data type short text, okay. So you can see that they're two different data types. Now what about short text? Well, short text allows both numbers and text and a combination of both. And so you want to keep that in mind, especially if you want to do some calculations between fields, like maybe multiply the purchase price by another field that gives them a discount, of maybe 10%. Those fields have to be numbers. They can't be short text, even though you just only have numbers in there. So with the barcodes, I'm not going to be doing any calculations with other fields with the barcode. So I can leave it at short text if I want. But if I wanted to change it because maybe I want to do some calculations with that field, well, let's go ahead and right-click on the tab, go to the design view, and there's short text. If I go, oh, okay, I'll go ahead and change it to number, and then click Save. Ooh, some data may be lost. Why? because the size of one or more fields has been changed to a shorter size. So do you want to proceed? It may truncate it. That's a good point. So you want to make sure that you set your databases up correctly. And if you want to downsize it, you may be chopping off some data. So I'm not going to do that and say no and not save this. So we'll go ahead and close out of here and leave it as short text. But instead, we'll come over here since nothing's been saved here and change it. Well, we can do it up here without going to the design view. Go to the fields tab, make sure the cursor is flashing in that field, and change in the formatting group 
from number to short text and then be sure to save it. So has it been updated? Well, you can check in the design view. You can right click here to go to the design or you know right click there to go to the design and yep it accepted it the data type short text. So now that we have the same data type short text for the asset tag in the notes table as it does for the asset tag in computers we can go ahead and click and drag and make sure we're just not clicking and dragging because you get into habit of doing that and you're not sure which one in a one-to-one -one relationship is the aggressor well you'll figure that out later on when you try to enter in one table and it says no I'm not the one that sets the values it's the other table it'll give you an error because it won't find it in the other table well if you're creating from scratch let's go ahead and dump it on top of the asset tag in the notes table so he's the aggressor he can set the values let's go ahead and enforce and update and delete related records if we'd like and click create and there you go now I don't know about you but this looks kinda messy our relationships are getting crossed and you don't want to cross anybody in a relationship kinda sets them off and there you go now if you want to be able to take a snapshot of this and send it off to somebody else for a review because maybe you don't want to send them your whole database so they can open it up and check out the relationships or maybe they don't even have access then come up here click on the design tab and go to the tools group and click on relationship report click on that and there you go hey isn't that fun it's in printable format now oh you may have to fix this so it's aligned perfectly it's getting kinda of out of control in any case you go ahead and click on it to zoom out to get an overall look at it and if it's more than one page you can go ahead and toggle it and then if you want to print it just come up here print preview is the related tab because we're in the print preview go ahead and click on print to print it off of course you can go ahead and change the page layout and we'll cover this in reports in a later training video but for right now if we're done you can go ahead and right click and close out of here or you can come up here and click on close print preview and now we're in the design view for that report that it generated which it hasn't been saved so we get the generic report one so if you want to save it for later on then come up here and click save and it'll save it as report I'm gonna click cancel close out not save it and if you're like oops oh rats well that's okay you can come back up here design tab and generate it again when it comes to managing your table data I'm talking about how to enter, modify, update, and delete your records. And the records that we're going to be working with will be in the employees table. Double click. How many records do we have? There you go. Down below in the record navigation bar, a total of 47. Now to enter in a new employee, a new record for the new employee, I need to get to the last blank row in the table. And I can do it one of many ways. I can either come over here and click and drag the scrolly bar down to the last blank row and then go ahead and click in and start typing in the data or let me hit the F5 key on the keyboard it's a shortcut key that takes me to the first cell in the table and other ways to get to the last blank row within the table is well you can come up here on the home tab to the records group you can delete save or hey create a new record And you can see when I hover over it you also have the shortcut keys control plus let's go ahead and click on it first takes me to the last blank row F5 key again and then the shortcut keys, let's try those. Control plus takes me to the last blank row. Hit the F5 key again. And then finally, down below on the record navigation bar, we've got our hey, new blank record. Click on it, and there we go. Last blank row. Now, when it comes to entering in a new record, well, this is your first time within the table, and you're like, I'm not sure what this field's about. Well, there's some indicators like, okay, employee ID is one. Second of all, you can see that the numbers are sequential. So 45, 46, 47, oh, 48. If they're still not getting it, remember in an earlier training video, when you design your tables, in the design view, you can type in notes for this field that will appear down below on the status bar that hopefully they'll look at. Well, if they watch my training video, they'll probably look down here and get a little bit more instruction about what's supposed to be entered into this field. Like if it's supposed to be their social security number and these are all mistakes, or from this point forward, we're going to have their social security numbers. What we can do is we can go back to the design view and over here again description is optional for the employee ID field but let's go ahead and just keep it simple SS pound for social security number let's go ahead and change the views click on view of course you gotta save it before you change it okay yes and then 
Anywhere in this field that you click for any record, even the last blank row, you can see the prompt down below on the status bar, the text, social security number. Let's do control plus to get to the very end. And if they still don't get it, maybe they haven't watched this training video and they're not looking down below on the status bar and they type in some text, well, I'm trying to hit two birds with one stone. So they're typing in text into what appears to be a numbers field and they misspelled the word the. When they hit the tab key, oh, they're going to get a plethora of options. First of all, it says the value entered does not match the number data type in this column. So you can't have any text in here. What are you doing? It says enter in a new value or convert the data in this column to the text data type. So you convert all this into text, which the text data type will accept both numbers and text and a mixture of them. Now, keep in mind, if this is a field that you want to use in a query later on to multiply another field by, like if it wasn't the employee ID, if it was the employee salary, and then you had another field about their hours they worked that week, they both have to be number fields. It can't be a text field. So you don't want to convert it to text. For me, well, I said it's a number field. I'll leave it as such. I won't convert it into the text data type. And so let's go ahead and say enter new value. So it updates it. And then I'll type in a new number. But before I do that, you get a little lightning bolt here. When you hover over it, it's the autocorrect options. Remember, Access looked at that misspelled word and said, I'll fix it. And maybe you didn't want it fixed. So click on the lightning bolt and you can change it back to T-E-H because maybe that's the name of the person. Or you can stop automatically correcting T-E-H so it'll stay that way. Or you can look at the autocorrect options, click on it, opens up a little teeny tiny window. So when I type in where it says replace the misspelled word T-E-H, you can see down below it's in the database. When somebody types in that, it's going to automatically, when you leave that field, fix it. So replace what you type here with that down below. If you don't want that, you can delete it. In which case, from that point forward, you can type in TEH all you want and it won't automatically fix it. And you can go ahead and do your own autocorrect options. If somebody types in this, maybe as an April Fool's joke, types in your name, you can replace it with, he is so awesome. In any case, that's besides the point. But let's keep it simple. Let's click cancel. If you want to access the autocorrect options, but you don't get the lightning bolt because maybe you moved on and you want to go back and update that, well, you can go backstage, click on the File tab, go down to Options, go to Proofing, and there you go, autocorrect options, same window. That way we don't have to wait for a lightning bolt or type in a misspelled word if we want to go ahead and update that. So let's go ahead and just type in a number as it says, hit the Tab key and continue on. Let's see, last name. And then you'll notice as I come over here to the end, I'm getting to the home phone number. Well, I can't see it. I assume it's home phone number. You can go ahead and click and drag the scrolly bar over, or you can just leave it as is, and then continue to hit your tab key to move over to the next field, the column, and then to go back so you don't have to lift your hands off of the keyboard. You can hold down the shift key and hit tab, and it takes me back, shift tab, back, then tab, tab, and now we're to the home phone number field. So when I start typing in a phone number, you'll notice that automatically we get some symbols in there. That's called an input mask. It's supposed to help the person inputting with this mask field here to guide them to what to enter into that field. Because if I just said home phone number, maybe they'd just type in the number without the area code, and maybe they wouldn't use dashes. So to control the front end user's input, and we'll learn about this in a later training video, how you can set up your own input mask for things like home phone number, zip code, like maybe you want the dash with the extra four numbers instead of just the five digit number. In any case, watch for that. So here when I see this, I'm like, oh, they want the area code and you've got basically a line for each number. So when I type in, it erases that bottom line there and I can continue on, hit the tab key. Now, some shortcut keys to help you out here. If you see in the record above, in that field, data that's going to be the same as what you want to enter in here. Well, I could easily type it in 300, but the shortcut key is control apostrophe and it duplicates what it sees above. Cool, huh? Let me click and drag and scroll over, then hit the tab key. And then for the higher date, you can go ahead and type it in, like 4 slash 4 slash, and you don't have to type in 2000 and something or whatever it is. You can just type in the last couple of digits, like 07, hit the tab key automatically goes back and changes it to 2007. 
Let me hold down the shift key, hit tab to go back. You can do it that way, or you can pick the data picker, click on that little icon there, and then choose another date. That works. Or let me go ahead and hit the backspace key several times to get rid of it. If you want today's date, then go ahead and the shortcut key for that, instead of typing it in, is control colon. And let's go ahead and tab over. Now, how do you save your record? Well, there's one of many ways you can just close out, but I try not to get into the process of closing out of things because it's more of a habit. I mean, in Access, when you're in Tables, you're entering in records. If you close out, it'll automatically save it. But again, I don't want to get caught up in that because other Microsoft applications aren't so kind. You close out without saving it, you lose, well, everything. So you can go ahead and just hit the Tab key to go to the next record down below. Hold down the Shift key, hit Enter. You can, of course, come up here on the Home tab in the Records group and click Save, or you can come over here and you see that little pencil? It means it's in right mode. You can click on that and automatically gets rid of it and saves it. Or you can use the arrow keys if you're here. You know, if you want to make a change and you do, let's do 20, arrow up to the next record, automatically saves your change down below. If you want to search for data within your table, you can either eyeball it like, oh, there's sales representative right there, or better yet, Come down below and click in the search box and then start typing sales. Well, we got sales, but I'm looking for sales representative. So let's come back here and keep on typing REP. And there it is. Now that's record number nine of 48. So if I want to continue my search, hit the enter key and then it goes to record 24 of 48. Hit enter. There's number three. Well, that's Rocky Mountain sales rep. Oh, well, see, it's not an exact search. Hit enter again. There's sales representative. So if I want to get a little bit more particular, something that has more criteria than just what I type in here, then come up here on the Home tab, go to the Find group, and click Find. Or, as you can see when I hover over it, you got the pop-up that says you can use the shortcut keys Control F. In any case, do that or click on the button. It brings up the window. What do you want to find? I want to find Sales Representative. And where do I want to look? Well, the current document as opposed to, well, hey, I'm already in that field. If I select current field, then it doesn't search in any of the other fields. So if I have sales representative in other fields, but I just want to focus on the title field, well, current field will work. And then as far as the match, any part of the field that has sales representative in it, or do you want the whole field to have sales representative in it and nothing else? Or do you want just the start of the field that contains sales representative and then whatever comes after, it doesn't matter as long as it starts with that. Let's go ahead and do the whole field. And then as far as the search goes, you can search the entire field, the title field, or you can start at that point and go up or down. That point meaning the current record that it's in. Let's go ahead and choose All and click Find Next. And it found one, Find Next. When you see the button highlighted like that, it means it's active. You can just hit the Enter key on the keyboard and it goes through until it finds them all. And then it says, OK, our search is done. We didn't find any more than what we already found. OK. Now, if you want to go ahead and after you find something, replace it with something else, like instead of sales representative, let's go to the replace tab. Of course, we still want to find it. How about if we replace it with sales rep? When it's abbreviated like that, it just sounds cooler. And so let's go ahead and look for that. We'll keep the options the same and say find next. Well, probably has to refresh our search. So, which brings up a good point. If we close out of here and I want to do a replace, you can bring up the Find window, Control F, and it brings up Find and Replace. Click on the Replace tab, or if you want to bypass that extra click, let me close out, Control H, and then it takes us to the Replace tab in the Find and Replace window. Okay, now let's go ahead and click on Find Next so we can refresh the search and it starts over, and it found Sales Representative. Let's go ahead and replace that. It replaces it, goes to the next one, and then I can replace that, replace that, or just replace all. It says, are you sure you want to do this? You won't be able to undo it. Well, we weren't able to undo it when we were hitting replace in the first place for each record. And this is for all the records that contain sales representative, which we have just a few more. So yeah, we'll continue. And did it do it? Well, there's one. Oh, how about if we go ahead and we type in sales rep? We can stay on the replace tab as long as I don't hit replace and find sales rep. There's the next one and the next. Oh, that's beautiful. Let's go ahead and close out of that and learn how to delete records. Let me do Control plus shortcut keys to get to the last blank row because I want to delete Doc. Let's say she 
is no longer an employee. So to get rid of a record, and this will do it permanently because you have no way to bring it back, so you may not want to do it, or you may want to create a backup of the table, which we talked about in an earlier training video. In any case, to delete a record, you can do it one of many ways. You can either go ahead and click on the row header, that little gray box that shoots across the row. Well, you can see the black arrow. When you click on the gray box, it means that it's selecting everything over to the right. And you can hit the delete key on the keyboard, and it says you're about to do it. Are you sure? We can say no. So I can show you the other options. You can also right click on the row header and delete the record, or you can. Well, if the entire row is selected, you can come up here on the Home tab to the Records group and click Delete. But if it's not, and you got the cursor flashing in a field, you don't get the Delete option until you click on the drop-down arrow to delete the record. And, of course, if you're in here and you accidentally delete something in there, it's in Write mode, so just hit the Escape key to get back out of it so it doesn't accept the change. So let's go ahead and click on the row header, hit the Delete key, and say Yes. and and then finally, you can add a totals row. In other words, below the last blank row, you can have a row that totals up, well, those fields that contain numbers. And to add a totals row, come up here on the Home tab to the Records group. And there you go. Click on it, and it adds it. So you got your blank row, but below that, you have a row that will total up. Well, you could do it for the number here, but I'll click on the drop-down arrow. But, you know, adding up an employee ID, yeah, wouldn't work for me. But you get the idea. You can go ahead and do that, and we wouldn't do it for text fields, so let's go ahead and scroll over, and of course not for number fields, like who wants to add up zip codes? No thank you. But we can come over here to the weekly hours, and again, that's the last row because the one above that, you see that little asterisk? That means that that's the new record row, so we don't want to mess with that. Again, it's the last row this time is the totals. Click in it, click on the drop-down arrow, and let's get the average for weekly hours, and it's 36.8. And our goal is 37. Anything less than that, people are doing more than just taking vacation. They may be out sick, and so, well, we're not meeting our weekly hours average here. And then for the hourly rate, we can click in there, click on the drop-down arrow, and you can find out who earns the most hourly maximum. It's 120. Good gravy. Who's doing that? And then we can go ahead and scroll over, find out who it is, and, oh, gosh, we ought to at least give them a bump down, $119. That'd make me feel better. And then just go ahead and click off, and that total row stays where it's at until you come back down. Do any updates by clicking on the drop-down arrow, or just coming up here on the Home tab to the Records group, and deselecting Totals, and it's gone. Thanks for watching. Hey, as a quick reminder, if you like my video, please give it a thumbs up. You can also click on me and subscribe to my channel to get notified of the latest videos. And for great specials on my products, please see the description below this video.